Welcome to the Art of Charm, Joe Coleman. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so we just want to kick this off, and for our audience, we'd like to get them to know you a bit better. So how did you get into the fitness journey, and how did that lead you into the fitness business? Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. This is such a treat. Um, yeah, so actually I started out just in fitness growing up, obviously sports background, went to school for exercise science, ended up getting my master's in nutrition, and I spent my entire 20s doing fitness competitions. So I don't know if you how much you guys know about that, but it's pretty extreme. Um, and I did that for about five or six years. I was kind of a recovering perfectionist, so what better way to prove myself than have a perfect body, get up on stage and be judged on that. So it was a little bit insane, um, but I ended up starting my business at jillfit.com as a blog in 2010 when kind of like the golden age of blogging when people were just kind of reading that and there wasn't Instagram and stuff and it was at the beginning of social media people really didn't know how to use it yet and and Jill Fit at the time was just a kind of day in the life kind of journaling for me and I blogged every day for two years and over that time we grew a really you know kind of like a podcast I guess um, a really dedicated readership for people who wanted to get up on stage or have some extreme fat loss or weight loss or something like that so we were doing a lot of one-on-one meal plans at that point and it was about a year and a half into the business I had hired on a team of like five additional coaches we were doing really well but we were totally maxed out it was like a great kind of problem to have but I realized that I didn't know anything about business I knew how to be a fitness pro I knew how to get lean I knew how to help my clients but I had no idea how to do business and so at that point I kind of did a deep dive into everything online marketing trying like sales trying to figure out automation creating courses and things like that and at that point I didn't have the money to hire a business coach so I launched my first business course to make the money to I didn't know everything but I knew at least what had gotten us to a six-figure business within um Um, you know, 18 months. So at that point, I launched my very first business course to pay for my first business coach. Um, And since then, it's just been an evolution. And that's it's been just a great ride. And what I love about your site and the blog is not only just fitness and not only just business, but also mindset. And I think that is often a, a missing piece for a lot of us. We get so focused on external goals and we don't realize that, well, it's gonna take the right mindset to get there. Totally. And I think that's one of the biggest things is, you know, I talk to my clients who want to lose weight or they want to change their body, want to get stronger. And it can't just be, I need to lose weight. Cause we all know like weight loss isn't that it's not rocket science. You just like don't eat and you exercise. Right. But we know that that's not sustainable. And we also know that that alone isn't healthy. So it's like, cool. Can you also like yourself? Can you also like how you look at whatever size and then do kind of the weight loss or fat loss, uh, f- transformation from that point. And so, you know, you can't, try and lose weight because you hate your body. You have to kind of figure out a way to enjoy the process. Otherwise, it's not going to be sustainable. So we might have noticed that about a year and a half in. And what we noticed was we were giving people meal plans, workout programs, and they were losing weight, but they they started gaining it all back. So they'd lose like 20 pounds, they'd gain back 30. They'd lose, you know, 30 pounds, gain back 40. And I was like, damn, like this is a huge disservice. And we really took it on. We're like, this is our problem. You know, the fact that this is happening, what in our methods is not working. And at that point, I kind of felt like it was irresponsible to give people these off the shelf meal plans that they just like had to follow or else they didn't know how to eat. We had people literally texting us from the grocery store, unable to make a decision about ketchup without texting us. And I'm like, as much as I think that's kind of like, you know, kind of crazy or psycho, but I was like, it's our issue that they're doing this. And so totally revised things. Now we teach something called Moderation 365, which is how to eat the same on Saturday that you do on Monday, which is always hard, especially if you come from a dieting background. You go, oh, you know, I need to be on point. I need to be tight. I need to have all my Tupperwares ready to go. Um, and so I teach people, I think we were talking off air, that I haven't actually cooked since 2011. And so I teach people how to be able to eat healthy wherever they are and that's kind of a mindset shift especially if the women i work with they have 10 15 20 years of yo-yo dieting well even we were having that conversation before we started and we were just talking about uh, intermittent fasting and the american breakfast (laughs) and it's it's certainly it's we people need educated on these things and for a lot of people it's like well if i just lose the 20 pounds then i'm good and then they stop all the work and they stop the the discipline that got them there and it's like well no this is you're now educating and educating yourself and your body on what you're going to need to maintain this and and so yeah there's going to yeah, to getting them up to speed on how that's going to happen. Yeah, and I think we, when we're seeing results, we're like, oh my God, I could do this forever. It feels so good. I'm losing weight. I feel light. 
but then you actually have to ask yourself, do I even like these foods? Like these yeah. are some of the questions we don't ask. Can I see myself 10 years from now eating six times a day, seven times a day, not taking a vacation because I'm scared of what food I'm going to be exposed to? You have to ask yourself like longevity wise, is this possible? And I think sometimes we don't, we just like the way it feels that we don't actually ask ourselves, can I see myself doing this forever? And so that's kind of the hint of, okay, is this going to be sustainable? And you, you might lose slower. You might transform your body at a slower pace, but you know that a year from now, any weight that you do lose you're going to have you're going to it's going to be off forever yeah it's a lifestyle change yeah. and and i kind of hate that term because it's been so overused like just change your lifestyle habit change <laughs> but that really is it's not sexy what's sexy is the 21 day detox yeah. and the seven day jump starts and like those kind of things and it's fine but i think we all i think you have to go extreme a little bit before you can come back to the middle and that's kind of what i help people do obviously your lifestyle up until that point of the decision to lose weight has led to this problem in the first place. Yes. So you're going to have to undo those bad habits and start to build better relationships and better decision-making processes to handle all these things. Because let's be honest, who wants to live a life of chicken and broccoli and not oh. traveling, <laughs> right? Yeah. You, you want to be able to enjoy your life too with the process. Yep. Now, what's also fascinating about your journey is just how public you've been about everything. Starting a blog, blogging sure. every day, documenting your own inner struggles yep. and growing the business. Obviously, attracts fans but also detracts some haters and people who may not like your viewpoint what do you use mentally to overcome some of the negativity that comes with leading such a public life um yeah it's such a great question you know i'm like kind of a weirdo in, in that i do really appreciate uh trolls from the perspective of i always get to learn so at the beginning i really i, I would get you know trolls or haters or comments on youtube videos and stuff like that you guys know how it is and i would really take them on and it would really like hurt my feelings and it would take me days and maybe even a week to like kind of get over it and process it um because i i think that it hit the insecurity that maybe i already had so if I had any insecurities of I'm a fraud or I'm feeling like an imposter or I'm not good enough to do this, if you have a hater or troll or even someone who you know personally, you know, kind of disagree with you publicly, it feels really uh, almost threatening and you kind of take it on. And until I had enough reps to see that my methods actually were working and that they, that, and I could have some confidence in what I was teaching, I really did take it on. It took me a long time. And now when I get blowback, sometimes it's really I don't know, like, I'm kind of like, oh, okay. I didn't realize I was coming off that way. And so it has helped me get better at clarifying my message. And so I don't necessarily agree with it or have to take it on, but I do see it as an opportunity to get clear in my communication of the thing I'm trying to teach. And so, I don't know. I mean, for me, it's good practice. And I actually personally like love debate. So I'm like, cool, let's actually have a conversation. I think it's rare to be able to have a conversation on uh, social media, but I enjoy it. Yeah, it's usually just yelling. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and also like, when you think about it, it's really not that scary. It's like someone on, they're just on, a, it's a person on keyboard somewhere else in the world, you know? So when you think of it that way, it kind of dissipates the, uh, the, the anxiety of it or, you know, like the, the threat of it. Yeah. And it's, it's funny because I feel like a lot of us, our first instinct is to just ignore it entirely. Yeah. Like but delete there band, is right? lessons to be gained sure. from the feedback we're getting and not all of them have to be tearing you down. They could be constructive and ways of thinking, Oh, Oh, maybe I need to change my presentation or, Oh, I didn't think of that viewpoint. I hadn't brought that into my consideration. You know, well, one, one of the things that's interesting, sorry to cut you off, it's like, you know, especially when you talk about, you guys probably get this too, when you talk personal development, sometimes you're not thinking about, um, you know, you're not thinking about like mental health necessarily. So sometimes people go, well, it's under, you know, I understand that you, everyone has a personal choice and that's important. You can choose your attitude, you can choose your actions, but when you're dealing with mental illness, like you don't always have a choice. And so that those are some of the things that I don't always think about when you talk about personal responsibility and like, you know, being able to change your life. And and then you're like, oh, okay, cool. I never saw it through the, that lens, but now I kind of see, and it doesn't mean I'm gonna change my message necessarily, but it's something to consider. Well, there's so much negativity online, it's hard to decipher mm. what is the, what is teaching me something? What is the drunk guy who at 3 a.m. who just <laughs> fired off some random comment because he was upset from going out the, that evening? Mm -hmm. And then who who is actually giving you advice like, hey, you're actually wrong here. Here's the research to, to show you that. I hope you take on this new uh, development. It's like... It's, it's difficult because everyone's just yelling at you and it's all coming on at you at the same time. And there's no context to any of it. And it's up to you to decipher yep. what that is. And most of what's being said, to be honest, wouldn't be said face to face. They wouldn't come up to you. Be, how weird would that be at the grocery store? Someone's like, you suck. And you're like, wait, what? Wow. Okay. <laughs> just trying to check out over here. <laughs> so funny. We would never do that in person. And well, just to add to that. The other stuff that's going on, and we were talking about this earlier as well, AJ and I 
of, of building this company for 12 years. You've been doing the podcast. Uh, how long did you say? Year and a half. Yep. So there's a lot of information that's going on out there. And so there's other things about you and your views and where you stand that people don't agree with. And because they don't agree with that, they're looking for other things to nitpick at, at mm -hmm. you at as well. And it's like, where is these things coming from? So it, it's a, it's, it's so much feedback and it's coming from so many places and it's hard to decipher what, it is an interesting space to be in where you're you are a creator and you're putting your like creation out into the world whatever that looks like and you just you know don't you live in a different place like for example we're all in los angeles and i feel like everyone who lives here kind of has like a very just open attitude oh, open-minded yeah. and then so you're surprised sometimes when you get blowback in a different place or from you know kind of a different space that you hadn't anticipated and so yeah it's interesting navigating i enjoy it but to your point when it's just cruel or disrespecting someone in my community then it's just delete and ban right yeah. and i think another difficult part for us is we just have our own lens and our own story yeah. to fall back on. You know, I can't put myself in every single social media follower's shoes and, and understand their journey. Sure. I'm trying to share my journey and some things that have worked for me might work great for you and some things might not. And I also feel a lot of times in the influencer or creator space, there's this perception that we're perfect, we're infallible, and uh, we do a good job of hiding some of our fallacies and, and inadequacies on social media. So it sort of, you know, continues this path. But being open, being vulnerable, being honest about some of your struggles is really how you can connect with your tribe, with your audience. And you had a very public breakup. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, there yeah. was an affair evolved. Yeah. And when, or fortunately, yes. when it comes to, <laughs> to this side of the coin, you know, this month, we've been focused on navigating relationships. We started the month talking about relationships in a new city moving into a new career and taking on more responsibility at work and then talking about okay in our romantic life when is the right time to move in together be exclusive how do we handle money and what happens when we're drifting apart so today we want to talk about what happens on the other side of things when mm -hmm. the relationship that you thought was mm -hmm. this amazing thing and mm -hmm. even publicly outsiders sure. are looking at it as saying this is incredible yeah. but it isn't working out yeah. and it has to end and unfortunately relationships do end yeah yeah, I mean, it's it's so multifaceted. And so just to give everyone a little bit of background, um, I was married for 10 years and I was married to someone who I was actually in business with as well. And we kind of came up together. So as Jill Fit was building, so was his company, Metabolic Effect. And I was working as well with ME. Um, and we were just growing our businesses and, you know, it was kind of like one of those traditional kind of like love stories. Like, I can't believe I found my person. And it was just, I don't think anyone ever gets married or gets into a relationship thinking that at some point it's going to end. So, um, I think we just took a lot of things for granted. Like we were working together, you know, we we're living together. We were traveling together. We were just spending almost every second of the day together pretty much. And we loved it and we loved it for a long time. But I think when you're in that close proximity to the person and you're not having conversations around intentions, honesty, or letting a lot of resentments build and things like that. I mean, typical stuff, right? Like this, the story is no different than anyone else's kind of breakup story. Um, but it was a little bit different in that I actually found out about uh, my ex-husband's affair and after it was over for about a year and a half. So it was this like weird, and you know, I'm a strong woman, so I think like in the back of my mind, in theory, I was like, oh, if my husband ever cheats, I'm definitely leaving. And that's kind of like the narrative now. But for me, it was kind of this weird place where he wasn't involved with a woman. And meanwhile, it had been a long-term affair. I'd like fallen in love with someone else. So it was definitely like all of the emotional stuff too. Um, and I was in a position where I didn't know if I should stay or go. Like the cultural narrative, at least now, is that you leave. That's just like the only option. Otherwise, you don't respect yourself. But we still wanted to try and work on it. And in fact, actually, more than half of couples who go through infidelity end up staying together. I don't know how much you guys have talked about infidelity on the podcast. But no, I'm, we I'm haven't. Really, okay, cool. I'm happy to just go all in on it because this is yeah. a lot of what we talk about in ours. And so that was a kind of an interesting place to be. And one of the things that happened as a result of that is we ended up staying together for another year. But I realized that this thing over here wasn't solid. So I started traveling a lot on my own. Started, I lived in um, Amalfi Coast for like three weeks. I was Beautiful. in Sydney for a month. Like I went to Paris for three weeks with girlfriends. And I was kind of like, okay, this thing isn't solid. I need to batten down the hatches and figure out how to be alone if that's what I'm gonna be doing. So kind of traveled a good amount um, towards the end of that year 
his family and he and I went to uh, one on Europe a trip to Europe for like nine weeks. And we said, you know, what? let's just not talk about our relationship while we're here we're with all these people. Let's just like have a great time. And at this point, we were still best friends and still it wasn't like moment to moment bad. Um, we ended up having like a great time, came home from that trip and had a series of conversations and nothing had really changed. And, and to give everyone kind of context, the reason why his affair ended was because he caught his lover with another guy. So it was like this, like kind of very uh, like meta almost yeah. situation. And so he was going through a heartbreak. And so he was still really caught up emotionally with the other woman. And so I'm sitting here being like, cool, you're chasing her. I'm chasing you. No one's chasing me. Like, what am I doing here? Like how things are not really changing. I was willing to work on it. He wasn't really in an emotional space that he could. So within a week, I literally packed up all of my stuff. I gave my stuff, half my stuff away to Goodwill, packed up my car and drove across country to LA. So like within a week was just had a new lease in Santa Monica and was out here. Um, and at that point, things were okay between us, but that year, that next year, things were just like really tumultuous. And so the whole point of kind of bringing this up is, the cultural script is, I'm the victim, he's the perpetrator, right? And that's kind of like the only thing we always like end there. I actually went to Barnes and Noble to start like looking at books for like, what do you do after an affair? How do you re repair a relationship? And all the advice was just stuff that f made me feel really out of my power. It was like, he needs to pay and you know he needs to apologize and like all of these kind of things where it was all about him choosing the relationship or him choosing me and that made me feel really powerless. Sure. And so I was like, it can't just be this where I'm just the victim and like all men cheat and it can't just be that narrative. And I don't wanna be the kind of person who doesn't believe that things can last. So um, for that year after, I was really bitter, I was super uh, resentful, just really hurt. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Byron Katie's work. Yeah. Yeah, so I went to, she has a four day, live event here in LA. I'd been in LA for six months, didn't know anybody. So it was like super lonely, trying to be like, learning how to be single and alone and all that kind of stuff. Went to her four day event and she has this thing called, it's called judge your neighbor worksheet, where you have someone in your life and if you guys are listening to this and you do have, whether it's a partner or if it's a friend, coworker, whatever, I recommend doing this exercise. Um, it's called judge your neighbor where you write down, like you just judge the heck out of them. You write down like all the worst things about them. And then you question those statements. So mine were like, and my ex-husband's name is Jade. It was, uh, Jade is an adolescent. Jade is stubborn. Jade is self-righteous, right? Like all these kind of things, right? And so just went to town. And then you turn them around and you ask like, okay, uh, you can turn around to self. So it's, I am self-righteous. I am stubborn. And I was like, oh my God. This is me, like this is how I've been the last six months, right? I've been here in LA and I've been so mad at him. Meanwhile, he's like back in North Carolina, like not caring and he's doing his, he's carrying on. And I was like, I don't want to be this person anymore. I don't want to be hurt. I don't want to be angry. I don't want to be resentful. And just like that, I was just like, I'm done. And at that point he actually moved out to LA in a different part of LA. And we started having like a friendship and I started treating him with more compassion. And he started doing his own work and he started really doing a 180 and having a relationship to honesty and to integrity. And we could have conversations and like we just talked about everything that we didn't talk about for the years before. And now he's one of my best friends and there's nothing that like we can't share, nothing romantic, but there's nothing that we kind of can't share because it's all on the table. And so it was a really, uh, like tough thing that had to happen in order to get to this kind of more evolved place. And so, yeah, that's kind of the short, the short end of it. And so, you know, I think it's, and I look back when you say, unfortunately there's infidelity, it's like, yes, but at the same time, fortunately, because if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be here with you guys today. Right. And it, it's a part of your journey that's yeah. now you've learned from taking those lessons. And I think for most of our listeners, they're probably wondering what was the moment sure. that you would realize that he had changed and it was worth pursuing a relationship because I feel like yep. having moved across country and and now trying to start over sure. uh, a lot of our listeners are probably wondering well it seems like you're back to settling so what was that moment or maybe it wasn't sure. a moment but yeah. how did you know okay he's changed and this is worth a friendship yeah I love that you asked that and so one of the things that we didn't really talk about was the fact that this was public that was like fairly public because we talked a lot about our relationship and we were kind of like this power couple running these businesses together um, and so I was so embarrassed and I had so much shame around the affair uh, because like I couldn't share it on social media. I was sure. like, I was trying to just like, I didn't even tell my best friends that I moved to LA. Like I call, literally called my parents while I was on the drive. I was like, oh, I left the relationship. Like I was so embarrassed, didn't want anyone to know. And of course people were following me on social media. I was like, what are you, do you live in LA now? And I'm like, what? Like I was just not, I didn't answer any questions. Um, and 
that a lot of people are really attached to our story. I actually didn't talk about it publicly for about a year and a half. Wow. Um, people were asking me questions. I never responded. I was just very like, I was still trying to figure it out. So how could I even have a lesson at that right. point, you know? So, um, and so we did, he kind of made that 180, but it was through our constant desire to show up to conversations. And I, and I, don't want to belittle this part because I think if you're listening and you're going, well, you don't understand my ex is an asshole. And I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> there's maybe there's no hope there, but what both of us committed to, and I think it's because we were just good friends at a base level is we just kept showing up to the conversation and we were tripping over ourselves trying to communicate because neither one of us had really done that that well. Obviously that's kind of why things, there was a rift in the relationship. And so we kept showing up and, you know, and we just would, say the thing that we needed to say and like one person would storm out and then the other person would leave and then they come back and and so we had these like this year and a half of kind of the willingness to try to figure it out and try to understand and luckily he's someone who's also into personal development so he was confused he's like wait I don't even he didn't understand it to himself because he's like I love Jill how can I love two people at once that was confusing and so um this may not be possible for someone listening but it really helped me become a better communicator. Because it's two parts of communication, right? There's first knowing how you feel. Yeah. Most people don't even know. They can't even name the emotion. And then the second is, you know, being able to actually speak it and then let the other person have their response, right? We're always trying to manage how the other person's gonna receive it. We don't want them to be mad, disappointed, whatever. And so I practice just like sharing my truth and like letting the chips fall. And he did the same. And we have a question here from Eric, one of our listeners, and it is our QA episode. And I think it falls in line with this exact feeling is I get a lot out of your podcast, but sometimes I catch myself trying to mentally apply your tips to other people in order to <laughs> fix them. And I'd like to know some tricks to keeping my mind constantly focused on fixing only myself. I love the show. Great advice. And I feel like for a lot of people listening, you know, in your shoes, they're like, okay, well, we got to fix this other person. He's the problem, right? right? My business partner and my lover and, and right. it's all him and his actions. Right. So how do I fix him? And as you said, it gives away your power, right? And and there is a role that we all play in this communication breakdown. So how is it that you went about fixing yourself first and not just trying to fix him? Yeah, I think there is, especially when you're in something like this that feels so like high stakes, like a in, like infidelity situation, um, feels so scary. It is hard to take responsibility and it's hard to forgive the other person because it feels like condoning the behavior. So I think as long as I had my anger about it and my resentment and my hurt, as long as I was upholding those feelings, it felt like it was keeping him on the hook. And so I think one of the things that needs to happen is realizing that they're human too. And I was able to have like some empathy for him, which was really hard because it felt like a betrayal of myself. Like if I even show, like, as I was like, how dare you have lessons, right? Like you're not entitled to any lessons. Like you're just the perpetrator. But realizing not only do you have feelings about it, but that other person has feelings and lessons. And even the third person in the thir in the situation has feelings and lessons about it. And I think that was hard to let go of my ego in that moment to realize. And I think there's a difference between, um, taking it on, like making it your fault versus taking responsibility. So I don't blame myself in terms of it was my fault and I did, I mean, you know, infidelities, people have free, free will. So it's not like I did something and that caused him to go and do whatever he was gonna do. It's just literally like, cool, what was, I'm now in this situation as a result of what has transpired, what can I do from here? Like, where can I go? And for me, moving physically helped me move emotionally. And I don't think that everyone can afford to like move across the country, but I think what different thing, like how can you put yourself back in your power? Can you take a class? Can you join a group? Can you travel? Can you do something alone to start f building your self-efficacy that you can do something outside this relationship? And so, yeah, it's like a little bit of putting you know, your ego aside and then also realizing that you can take responsibility without taking the blame. And obviously that judge your neighbor concept <laughs> applies here too, right? Yeah. If you're feeling like you have to fix this other person, and whatever that problem may be, I think you should turn around on yourself and say, maybe I'm struggling with this problem and ask yourself, why do you feel the need to fix it in someone else? Is it because you're trying to avoid fixing it in yourself? Yeah, and I think there's something to be said when you're in a relationship, it's never about I, it's it's always we. And then when once you're out, you have to learn to go back to I again before you can start fixing the problem because you're always going to approach it as a we. And in that case, then, then someone is the perpetrator, someone is the victim, and now you're looking at how can you have your power when you're looking at that person in that in that manner. Yep. Um, and then here, you know, something that, that strikes me that he wrote in here is, 
I catch myself trying to mentally apply your tips to other people. So it's like, well, you're not articulating what you'd like from them. You're just hoping that these, they start, they, they, they pick these things up and hope is not a strategy and, and, and just hoping they're going to someday get it is certainly not going to, that's not going to help them at all. And I, I think that telling someone else they need to change or fix something oh, is, never is, no. is not going to be met with, you know, positivity and, oh, thank you for that. But the opposite is you can show them the possibility of change by changing yourself yep. and inspire someone to change. So putting in the work and, and as we've all talked about, you know, and sharing that work with others can inspire other people to follow along. And that comes with being vulnerable and owning yeah. your think, own faults. I think it's definitely possible to state your preferences. So one of the wor- one of the things that we do at my podcast is called The Best Life Podcast. And one of the things we talk about a lot is honest communication. Obviously, that was a huge piece of my journey. And I find that it's so hard for people to honestly say what it what's on their mind to their partner or to their coworker to their boss or whatever because they're constantly worried about how it's going to be perceived and to your point like telling someone they need to change is never going to be met with positivity right but you can state your preferences and it's not so that they'll agree with you it's so that they can know, right? Because if, if you don't tell them, they don't know. And they may or may not be able to take it on. They may or may not be able to change those results. But it's for you to practice s- stating your needs and then just letting the chips fall. And so I have like a really, I don't know if you guys are interested, but I have like a 3S system that I teach my clients. And it's how to have an honest conversation to, to bring up something that you are, you know, kind of swallowing and not allowing yourself to bring up in a relationship. So the first S is set the stage. This is when you tell them that you're really, that you're feeling vulnerable that you're kind of scared to bring this up because you're worried about their response. You're worried about how they're going to take it. You don't want to hurt their feelings, but you really want to bring up something and you're, you feel really vulnerable. So when you do that, you kind of get them on your team ahead of time versus like in the, in the heat of an argument being like, you need to do this. Like that's never going to be like when it's high emotion. So find that place when it's like emotionally neutral and say, Hey, I really want to talk about something. I've been a little bit nervous to bring it up because I'm just, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but I feel like I really want to share it with you gets them on your team a little bit. It's like an icebreaker. The second S is just state your truth as, as clearly as you know it in that moment. Cause we know that truth is evolving. Like we just know like what we feel in the moment. Now you're going to state it as clearly as you possibly can. And then the last part's the hardest part. And that is stick it out, stick it out. Like, ah, like I want to manage their response and I want to like, they're going to get angry or they're going to get disappointed or they're going to have their, you know, whatever response that they're going to have and take it on. They're going to be defensive and you need to allow for them to have that. And so, cause that's the whole part of it is trying not to change what you're going to say to consider them, to state it as clear as you can. And to me, honesty is a service, honesty without cruelty, right? Honesty with empathy. But I think that honesty is inclusive. I think when you talk about affairs, that's the, the part that is the most hurtful. It's not the actual physical act. It's the exclusivity. You didn't have all the information. I wish that it ha- I had known when it was going on. So I would have had a choice in the matter. And so to me, honesty is inclusive and it's a gift. It's like the best thing you can do to the people that you say you love. And I think the important thing to realize is that Everyone processes that truth differently. And a lot of times when we, you know, truth bomb someone and we we share what we're feeling, their reaction, if it doesn't go as planned, you know, can frustrate us and and we become very selfish and like, well, no, I want you to hear this and I want you to change and realize that some people are going to take it very silently and they're going to have to process it. Maybe not in the moment. It may take days, weeks, even months for it to fully hit them. Some people are going to be very reactive to it and and maybe even blow up, but it doesn't mean you're not heard. And I think that's we oftentimes we project what we expect is going to happen. And then when it doesn't happen, we're like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I I shouldn't shouldn't have brought it up. I'm just not. See, I can't even bring it up. And I know, you know, throughout my relationship, Amy has been honest with me and then honest when my reactions have disappointed her. And I've had to explain, like, this is how I process the information. And I just want you to understand that the behavior change and the actions that follow in the days, weeks, and months after are a lot more important than my reaction in the moment. Yeah. Because the way I was conditioned and grew up is I was the passive recipient of anger and yelling. (laughs) So me shutting down and processing is just how I've come to deal with it. It doesn't mean I'm not going to change and it certainly doesn't mean I'm not listening. Yeah, there's been, I mean, we've been working together for 12 years and obviously not everything is going to go easily, especially in the beginning when you're duking it out just to try to create something and make something happen. But, you know, in those times, there's been uh, conversations we had to have with each other. And it's like, it always, we would always do this, the, the one thing. It's like, listen, I'm going to tell you some things in the moment right now. You do not have to answer. And I'm not expecting an answer. All I, and in fact, 
All I want is for you just to hear what I'm going to say and take a few days with it. Yeah. And, then, and then let's have a conversation about it. And it's like, here's what I'm thinking. And it's like, I don't like any of what you just said. <laughs> so, but I'm going to take it home yeah. and I'm going to stew on it. And then it's like, you go through the emotional theater and it's like, you get worked up, but then you're able to work through it. It's like, okay, cool. th there's a point there. I have an argument for that. That piece there we need to discuss and it's like well great we are now moving beyond just those initial feelings and now we can get to somewhere where we're both happy because if two people sit down and are adults and can communicate and articulate their issues then there should be a win-win here and if we're fighting for the same thing then well then it should be easy for us to find that yep yeah i think it's one of those things where you have to like the first time that you have that really uncomfortable, and I love you guys, and have, obviously you worked together for such a long time, you've had those instances. Every single person who I'm close with in my life, we've had those moments of like, ah, I could easily not bring this up, right? I could easily like not do the thing. But when you engage in that difficult, kind of awkward even conversation at times, it really does deepen the connection. Mm -hmm. And it really, and it's a trust builder in the relationship. Like I know that you won't run away from, like I don't want you to be resentful. I trust that what you tell me, I take what you say at face value, and that's a huge trust piece. And I also don't want those blind spots, right? Yep. We we sit here and we're talking about our clients' blind spots and things that everyone's working on. And for me, I don't want to be surrounded by people who are willing to be dishonest to protect my feelings yes. because that blind spot is going to just be exacerbated over time. And if I'm trying to work on myself, I want my friends to hold a mirror up to me and allow me to see the true me and not just uh, what they perceive of me. I think the other difficult part with all of this is allowing the time and the space for that healing to happen. Yeah. Because, you know, in the moment, as Johnny said, there are emotions tied to it. And, and sure. we try our best to wait for that moment where, you know, we'll be the calm before the storm. But even in those moments, the initial emotions of feeling attacked, feeling defensive, feeling, no, I have to share what I'm seeing, what I'm feeling. You know, that's not the, the most important point. It's the days and weeks and months that follow and the actions that are taken sure. to course correct. Now, coming out of this, obviously, you had to feel some heat publicly, right? And, and you were afraid to share. And when people have this vision and idea of you and the power couple in their head, mm -hmm. and then that's not there any longer, mm -hmm. you know, it leads people to be really reactive and judgmental in a time when you're like, hey, I'm just trying to heal. Right. So how did you go through that process? That was hard. Um, There's a lot of people really angry at him, you know, which is fine. You know, and, and by the way, when I when I finally started talking about it publicly, I had worked through everything. So it wasn't like this very reactive kind of like, you know, we talk about, I know you guys have talked a lot about toxic relationships. Like I don't even see, I don't see him as toxic. I don't see, I just see it as someone being superhuman and, and mm -hmm. like not superhuman, but human and uh working through stuff and unfortunately it wasn't a little bit in the public eye so there were a lot of people who were really upset with him i was worried that people were going to see me as a doormat just to be super honest like as a strong woman the fact that we were still friends i was i didn't really get any direct judgment but i was i think people were maybe judging that how could you possibly still be friends with someone who did that to you and I'm like I get it believe me I went through all of those emotions and so a lot of when I was talking about it I had already gone through my angry phase I had gone through my resentment my hurt I had felt all of those feelings for the last year and a half and I had really worked through a lot of that stuff so I kind of um, started kind of preempting my conversations by saying I've already thank you like thank you I know you're gonna be upset I know that you have some judgments whatever I would appreciate if you kind of kept those to yourself because I'm actually in a really good place and I know he got some heat but he's been super open about it as well and his own lessons and it's interesting he didn't really feel fully committed to changing or shifting until what was done to me was also done to him so it was like this betrayal sandwich right so he was like it didn't really occur to him how much he like the uh the pain or whatever he was inflicting on me until it was inflicted on him by his ex so that was a really interesting kind of come around this is a person i say i love the most and i am well i'm lying to them and so he had that moment of like okay who am i as a man you know i have no integrity i'm a fucking coward can i cuss on this sorry yeah. mm -hmm. okay <laughs> like i'm a coward you know he had all those kind of like really embarrassing kind of things come up for him too and again, it's hard to give any credence to his lessons because I'm like, how dare you have lessons? But you get to that point where you realize that we're all, there are three different people in this experience. It's a shared experience, but they're three different perspectives. And so when you kind of see that, you just realize that it's up to you to figure out how you want to move forward. And I think a lot of people 
only like the black and white and and they like that narrative of yeah. okay strong women leave him and when we start to operate in the gray area that's when people are really uncomfortable and they don't know how to behave and a lot of times they will project what they think they would do in that moment sure. because they've been raised on this black and white norm and, mm-hmm. and we even saw it in the you know the presidential election where people judged Hillary for staying with him after going through mm-hmm. something that public and 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 knowing his history and that judgment is often coming from a place of having never experienced Not it knowing, yourself. and that's cool. Like I get that. You know, I, I'm I'm happy to validate that for people who've never been in the situation. I've heard literally dozens of people since this say, "Well, you know, if my husband ever cheated, I would definitely be out." And I'm like, "Good. Like I hope that you do. I hope that that's what." And I probably would have said that ten years ago too. Until you're in that thing, and you're like, "We built a life together," and like it wasn't as black and white. I didn't like catch him in the act. So it's like, it there's nuance there, and. You know, for a long time, I had a lot of shame around that too. And so I think working through that and trying to communicate that, at least on The Best Life, the reason why we, I have a co, um, co-host on The Best Life called Danny J. Her name's Danny J. And she, she went through the exact same thing with her husband. And so that's kind of how we came together to start that's talking right. about this stuff. Yeah, it was kind of crazy. Now, I would assume trying to repair the relationship and become friends and move into that place, that boundaries have to be set and healthy boundaries in order for you to both feel safe moving forward. And we got a question here from Samantha who is struggling with boundaries herself. She says, my question is about boundaries and how to maintain them. I've been seeing this guy for a few months. I really like him. We laugh all the time and spend a ton of time together. The problem is he'll tell me about other women he's been with pretty graphically and we'll talk about how hot other girls are in front of me. We haven't had a conversation about what we are, so I don't know whether I have the right to be upset about this. Two questions. One, how do I set up a boundary here? And two, am I crazy to think that it's disrespectful for him to tell me these things? I'm here for the tough love, so please let me know. Ooh, gosh. Well, first of all, I would like to say that I'm not a relationship expert at all. <laughs> so, like, um, I mean, and I'm, I'm interested in hearing what you guys think, too. I mean, I think I'm a little bit different in this regard, that, like, that wouldn't bother me as much just because I look at the actions of the person. But I agree, like, if you don't want to hear, I mean, I wouldn't want to hear graphic, you know, interactions with the guy that I'm currently seeing his kind of past. So I would just say, hey, like, almost jokingly, like, I don't really need to know that stuff. You know, that wouldn't be necessarily. But, you know, if you're getting a hit when he's saying that other women are attractive, like, for me personally, number one, I'm like, other women are attractive. Like, that's never going to go away. So, but if you don't like hearing that, then you might say, like, that's making, that makes me feel a little bit insecure. Or, you know, I just want to know that, like, or, or maybe you guys need to have a conversation about the state of the relationship so you feel more secure. I think, number one, we need clarity on, on where we are before we go putting boundaries on other people because, you know, he may have a completely different perspective on what the relationship yeah. is or if it even is a relationship. So the first yeah. conversation to have is, you know, the what are we? And if you're feeling strongly that you're moving in one direction and he's not, then these behaviors make a lot more sense. But if he wants a relationship and you want a relationship, then yes, we need to draw a boundary around this behavior. And again, it comes down to the way you feel and you want to be with the partner that allows you to feel safe and feel respected. And some people aren't going to find that as disrespectful. Some people might be turned on by hearing those graphic dalliances that he's had before you or might be turned on by the thought of, oh, that other woman is attractive. So he may not know that this is even bothering you. Sure. Right. And a lot of times we have this internal response, but we have this stoicism about us, this poker face that the other person communicating with us can misread as like, oh, well, maybe that is turning her on or maybe she is interested in hearing these stories. So one clarifying what the relationship is is a very important first step and then two when it comes to boundaries it's being honest about the way these behaviors are making you feel and then drawing a line that says if you continue this i don't think i could be in a relationship with you because it does disrespect me and make me feel that uncomfortable yeah i mean obviously defining what this relation is relationship is to both of them but also you know another thing that this could be is him just finding out where these boundaries are and you know for him to find out how strong the relationship is if she's not saying anything and he's kind of wondering well what do we have here so there is there's questions all around the the relationship i mean she starts it out i'm just seeing this person for a few months that's exactly when these things need to be defined this has everyone wondering what's going on 
I'd be interested in your all's take because, uh, you know, I've been dating for the last like two or three years. I've been in a relationship now for about a year, but I spent a couple of years like just having fun and, you know, online. I hadn't been single since I was 18. So like being like dumped into the dating pool, mid thirties and a new city where I know no one. It was just like, it's and to say this, it was overwhelming. at this time period of, <laughs> of insanity of dating yeah. apps and the rest of the insanity. I know. I remember like getting on my first dating app and being like, can people see me right now? Yeah. Like I just didn't like really understand. So, you know, there, like, when do you suggest even having that conversation? I think from a woman's perspective, you know, they're like, oh, if I, am I going to seem needy if I'm like, hey, can we have a conversation about what we are? You know, what's kind of, what are the rules around that? Well, I honestly feel like trusting your gut is the most important here. And it's going to be different for everyone. Like, you know, my relationship with Amy, we met, spent a week together. And, and towards the middle of the week, I was like, hey, I, I want to move exclusive. And that surprised her. Because she was like, well, wait a second. I see you as a bit of a playboy in LA. I know about your your past and know that you've been single for a while. How do you know so quickly? And I was like, no, I'm trusting my gut on this one because I have dated and seen other women that I had, did not have this feeling with. So trusting your gut is the first thing. If, if you're feeling like, hey, I think this is a relationship, but I haven't clarified it, then that is the time to have the conversation. And listen, that conversation is always going to be awkward. <laughs> you know, I think a lot of us have this idea that, well, if I just say the right thing or I wait for the right Moment. position of the sun, yeah. <laughs> it'll be this perfect conversation that goes exactly as how I want it to. When it comes to boundaries, when it comes to setting expectations and when it comes to clarifying the relationship, especially if it's been and we don't know in this case, but if it's been, you know, heavy physical, a lot of chemistry, but maybe not compatibility yet, stating your intentions of where you want to be can clarify it for everyone. And I think we get in a lot of trouble because of the miscommunication around not being honest about our feelings and our intentions. Yeah, I mean, I mentioned it, this could be the guy to find out if this relationship is solid, waiting for the pushback. This, this, this could also be him saying, hey, I'm seeing other people or I'm finding other women attractive for, so for you not to get any ideas. However, or he it's could be too, trying to go for a threesome and trying to see if this turns her on. You yeah, know? I mean, so there's there's just a lot of communication that is not happening here and all the wrong communication is. I think sometimes having that like state of the union, re like relationship conversation can be scary because what if it's a no, then you go, I lose even the little bit of access that I have. I've certainly been in situations like that where it like hasn't been super clear, but I, but I know, and right now I'm like, just get to the no as fast as possible. Right. Like in yeah. a sense, but you do have that fear of what if they don't want the relationship, then that's reject. I feel rejected. I lose access. I got to cut it off, you know? And so, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And, and I, I've been in situations with women who've pushed for it and I said, no, I'm not ready. And we still ended up seeing each other and then ended up going exclusive. So I also don't think that just because you it's accelerate a, things it's that a check in. exactly that it's, it's again, black and white, like, Oh, okay. So you know, he's not ready for a relationship. So I got to scram. Right. It may just be, Hey, you know what? And we don't know anything about this guy's past, but it could be something of like, Hey, I just got out of a divorce. I just got out of a long term relationship here. I'm having fun. I don't know. I'm trying to find my feet under me. So I don't know where this is going and I, I'm trying to communicate my feelings and obviously they're being misread. So here's a question about jealousy that we got from Harry. Hello, AJ and Johnny, long time listener, first time asking a question. I'm in my mid twenties dating a girl in her very early twenties. Our relationship is going really well. We get along great and we enjoy going out on lots of dates. I'm someone who's pretty insecure. I'm so scared of my girlfriend developing feelings for other guys and cheating on me. It's not that I don't trust her, I do, but for some reason my mind keeps on imagining things I shouldn't even be thinking of. Should I open up and tell her I have these feelings? She's very outgoing and friendly and she has a lot of guy friends. I want to give her freedom, but there are things I'm not comfortable with, like her hanging out with these guys alone, which she hasn't done yet. I've heard a lot of the Art of Charm podcasts about high value women liking high value men who are confident. Insecure men are a huge turnoff. Do I just keep these fears to myself and not reveal my insecurities to her? I know this issue is on my side of the court. How do I address this? And should I open up to her about my problem? Many thanks. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of questions, a lot to unpack. Well, I, I do want to just, you know, one, take a step back and, and obviously coming from a place of being cheated on and now looking to move into new relationships, mm -hmm. you know, he's having these thoughts. Mm -hmm. How did you work through that mm -hmm. fear yeah. of oh, yeah. this happening again and start to trust yeah. your next partner? 
Gosh, yeah. Um, it was interesting. We actually did a podcast uh, for The Best Life about a year ago before I started my new relationship, and it was on how can you trust, well, can you trust men again? And so in theory, we had all the theories. We were like, oh, of course, we're going to trust. Like, it's better than just being hypervigilant and checking his phone and, like, doing all these kind of things. Of course, we're going to trust. Then you get into a relationship, and you catch feelings, and you're in that place, and things start to get real. And so there have been several times where, I don't know if you guys have heard of the book, The As If Principle by Richard Wiseman, but it's basically yes, like, okay. Yeah. I've read it. Yeah, so it's an amazing book. So I had that in the, in the back of my mind in moments where – I was insecure or found myself wanting to ask questions or who's there, who's going to be there, or like check his phone or all those kind of things. I was like, how would someone who trusts be in this instance? How would someone who does have that almost like blissful trust that I had before my marriage, like who, how would they act in this situation? And it's not easy, but I was like, that's what matters. It's the ru- when the rubber meets the road, do I choose to be a trusting person or do I not? Because it's so easy. I mean, you know, guys know it's like very easy to just ask questions and, and you can't help yourself sometimes. You won't know details like this person who asked this question and you want to know details. But I kind of had this moment where it's, I realized it was going to be death by a thousand paper cuts if I always had a question about where he's going, what he's doing, who's there, like, and all these kind of, so I realized I had to pick and choose my battles. And so by doing that, we just recently moved in together. And before I like signed over on the lease, I was like, can we have a conversation? And this is something that's important to me. And I don't want to talk about this all the time. In fact, I don't even want to bring it up again, but I need you to know that this is important to me and do with it what you will. But you know my history and moving forward, I need you to be honest in whatever way, shape or form you can. And it just because you are doesn't mean I'm going to be mad or I'm immediately out or whatever, but this isn't, things are like, the stakes are a little bit higher now. We're moving in, we're signing a lease, like we're on the hook for this. So um, I think picking and choosing your battles. And then I just stated, you know, this is my history, this is how I am, and I really appreciate inclusivity. In fact, that's really important to me. Take, take, like, do with it what you will. So I know that I said it. You know, nothing feels different really, but I know that I had a chance to say it in a really uh, direct and honest way, and I'm not gonna bring it up 100 times again. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely been interesting, but I asked myself in the moments, I choose the action of a trusting person, even if I'm not fully there. That's great. I love that. And something else that you said there I find extremely important is that you chose to go into it as a trusting person rather than an under trusting person. That is a decision. One of those decisions allows you to feel better about yourself, the relationship, and the, with the people that are going to be around you. One of those is toxic and it bleeds into other relationships uh, as as well, and it's going to corrupt those relationships, and and that's going to be a constant battle. So, choosing that I'm going to be somebody who trusts people uh, is choosing your power in that. And it's really about trusting yourself, isn't mm-hmm. it? So, for yeah, example, absolutely. there's no guarantee that this person's girlfriend is not going to stray. There's no, even though I'm I live with this person now, there's no guarantee that he's not going. So, I go, okay, cool. If the worst thing possible ever happened. Could I get through it? Do I trust myself enough to be able to handle it? And I don't know. I think that's a practice. For me, having gone through what I did, I know that I can. And I'm very open with that. I'm going all in. I'm being super vulnerable in this relationship while also still knowing that there's a possibility that that things could blow up or the same thing could happen again. And so the bottom line is, do I trust myself? And at that point, if you trust yourself, then you can trust anyone else. And that's that's kind of a hard hard. And I think there's there's two truths here that we have to realize. And, and number one is there's no relationship on earth where you're not going to feel this way of this little bit of insecurity. Sure. Like everyone can cheat. I've been cheated on. People listening are like, well, you teach this. You're a relationship expert. It happens. Relationships end. Relation, most relationships in your life are not going to work out. That's just how dating works. The second truth is, well, we're probably only going to date people that are going to be attractive to other people. Like that's yeah. just how life works. You you are with her because she's attractive. So obviously other men are going to feel the same way. There's not this shining light only on her and you see her one way and everyone else sees her as something else. Odds are we're going to be attracted to, to people that are attractive to other people. So it is an insecurity that's always going to be there. Mm-hmm. It's nothing that you're going to extinguish. But it's understanding and managing the communication necessary to build the trust and feel good taking the next step. I'm wondering if she is doing anything in her other relationships that is making him feel this way. We've all been in relationships where the other person 
because of their behaviors puts us in a position to feel insecure and on the other side of that have been in relationships because of their behaviors with other people make us feel very solid in our relationships uh, he's you know he st states that he's in his mid-20s yeah mid-20s that's pretty young and in, in relationships um so i has he been in both relationships and then of course for her you know she's she's a young woman she's developing she has a lot of power does she know how her behaviors affects him and the position it puts him in and i i think communication here yeah. is going to be key this yep. is not something you can hold on to no. and just hope it blows over it doesn't work that way <laughs> no. And, and, and that would actually would get like this incredibly terrible and, and situation. That, that's <laughs> how we would define low value behavior yeah. Yeah. is someone who is not forthright is someone who's holding on to their own insecurities and not allowing the other person to realize their behaviors and actions. And as we said earlier about the boundaries, it's creating a moment where you both feel safe and secure. So it's not in an argument. It's not after she just came home from mm -hmm. a night out with her guy friends and, and you're upset. But having time and space first to feel safe, to be honest. And the second thing here that we do got to take a step back and realize is we all want to be in a relationship with people we can be honest about our insecurities with. Right. You know, and maybe that's just me in my 30s. Maybe me in my 20s didn't <laughs> feel that way. But I would hope that we would find someone who we can own our insecurities around and understand that we all have them. And she's probably feeling her own insecurities and she may be using her insecurities and, and surrounding herself with men to allow herself to feel good in this relationship. Like, see, I have all these other options, but he doesn't know any of this because he's not having the conversation with her. He's writing into a podcast. So the first step is to actually have a conversation with her. And it's not to, to draw boundaries saying you can't do this, you can't hang out with these people, yeah. but it's more about being honest of like, hey, it makes me feel uncomfortable. So the more information you could give me, the more comfortable I'd feel. Right. Yeah, I think inclusion here is a big one, too. So if, you know, if she has other guy friends, like, I don't know, maybe y'all should go out to coffee or like at a drink sometimes. So at least like they know that you exist. I think sometimes that can be where things break down as well. But also like as a caveat to having the conversation, if you're having the same conversation in three months, if you're having the same conversation in six months, if you're having the same conversation in a year and things are not changing on any side, then that's probably a red flag. Right. Because you've expressed your discomfort and, and they haven't changed because they don't right. respect or you your discomfort. Or you haven't done the things that you needed to to bolster your own self-confidence. I am a little concerned about codependency here, though, as well. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of us, and, and this is very common in our 20s, we find that special someone and then all of a sudden we leave our friends behind. Yes. And we just want to spend every moment sure. with that person. And when they don't feel the same way and they don't reciprocate that, then our mind starts to wander of, oh, there must be other options options out there. I think it's important for him to cultivate relationships yes. with men and women outside of his relationship. That's a stable, healthy relationship. That's not one that has codependency. So if you're sitting at home getting frustrated because she's out with her friends, guys or girls, maybe it's time for you to go out with your friends or meet some new people and, and get your mind off of it too. When you're busy, right? Idle hands lead to these thoughts. When you're busy, you're probably less concerned. Matt is struggling with an ex-partner he shares children with. How do you deal with toxic relationships with an ex when there are children involved? Even after six years, we still cannot have a conversation about the children without my ex plunging into the reasons for the breakup and apportioning blame on me. I try to listen and not comment, but she can use up my time in the argument. I've been firm that I'll only talk about the children or insist on written communication what I get in return is abusive language or long-winded messages mm -hmm. that are often not about the children. I have a new partner now and will only start a conversation if it impacts the children. But when these conversations comes up, she uses them as an opportunity to unload everything on me. Mm -hmm. Would love advice on how to deal with someone I cannot completely cut out of my life. It's, first of all, this is just unfortunate because there's children involved. And anytime there's children involved, there, there's a lot. We have a lot to lose. And um, with that, I would just say a lot of times, you know, we have in our mind, oh, once children get involved, we'll change behaviors and we'll just <laughs> put the children first. That very, very rarely happens. So these problems were probably there before you had children. And then now it's being exacerbated by the fact mm -hmm. you're no longer together, but you have children. Well, and not only that, children end up being weapons against each other. And that's certainly not helpful for anybody. Um, and... and <laughs> And uh, I just, I'm just looking at this because it seems to me, at least in Matt's case here, that he's trying to have a relationship. He's trying to talk to her uh, and he certainly isn't 
getting anywhere. Have part of me still uh, wants to ask Matt though, as has he allowed her to fully l- unload everything that she needs to say? And has he allowed her to feel that she's been heard and he fully recognizes all of those feelings. And now can we have a dialogue for has he, or has he, and when she started these things, has he just ran off and said, I'm only interested in talking to you if you want to talk about the children. Gosh, it is really so hard because as he's describing his ex, I, like that could have been me very easily could have been me because when you hang on to those resentments, yeah. you know, you do like the person just disgust you. Like every time you see them or hear them, you like just want to go off because you're in so much pain. And so it's hard because my advice to Matt would be like, okay, and I agree with you, Johnny, but like letting her have that full space and acknowledging those things. But at some point he has to detach from that. It's not his business to manage how she feels anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the hardest things is because obviously someone he shares children with and like he wants her to feel okay and he obviously doesn't want this vitriol, but at the end of the day, like he's gonna have to figure out a way to inoculate himself because she's still processing whatever he, and obviously he's moved on. And so he's gonna have to figure out a way to not be as triggered by it. Yeah, well, I think it says six years, so they should have moved on. <laughs> well, I, I would say to that end that with the fact that you're trying to raise children together and the fact that you know we don't know who has custody and, and what the split is and who's spending more time with the children, that to that point, allowing her the space, even as difficult as it may feel to you right now, to heal and even saying, Hey, I, I want to get to a better place between us. And I know right now we're not there. I'm willing to go to therapy yeah. with you to have a healthy relationship and demonstrate a healthy relationship for our children yeah. and allow her to see that he's willing to participate because he cares so deeply about right. the children. And to Johnny's point, you know, this resentment that's been building and it's still going for six years, like there's an immense amount of pain behind it. Yeah. And now it's in a situation where it could impact your ability to be there for your kids, to be that good father, because if it's bleeding out and you're trying to set boundaries and it's still happening, then what do you think is happening when he's not there behind his back? And and that's what we don't want to see happen is the toxicity then falls onto the children's lap and they have to try to process it. And and let's be honest, most of us as children don't have the tools. We barely have the tools as adults to process this. You're just trying to orient yourself to anything and it's going to be your parents and you're going to replicate the behaviors that you're seeing. And Uh, when kids are involved, (laughs) sometimes it takes one of us being more mature and we know it's painful and we know, Hey, internally I'm, I'm losing my own respect by having to deal with all this, but to create that space to let her fully heal the wound, then after that, and maybe you have, maybe you've tried that and didn't work, then to that point, I think it is important to enforce the boundary, right? It sounds like he's not enforcing the boundary. He's saying, I only want this written communication. I only want to talk about the children. But then he still finds himself in yep. conversations where she's abusing him. Those are the conversations where the phone gets hung up, yep. where you leave the room, yep. you leave the house, you don't allow yourself to be put in that position over and over again. And coming from divorced family and, and having a situation where I never really get my mom's side of the story, I only had my dad's side of the story, it can color your worldview and impact the children in ways that he may not even be realizing or thinking about. Mm-hmm. When I, Part of me, when I read this, I just see them squabbling back and forth at each other because they're still trying to win the argument, but yet there's the, the damage is going to the, the children. And it's at some point, when are you going to hold them uh, up, you know, and, and focus on them rather than the, the argument or the fight that they're, they're having here? Yeah, it sounds like it's it's definitely like a pride thing, too. I think that mm-hmm. into your point about like putting your ego aside, I think that's one of the hardest things. But what really helped for me was taking that person off the pedestal and just going like, man, like you said, there's a world of hurt behind that anger and that frustration and almost seeing them. And I hate to say it kind of sounds it sounds a little condescending, but like seeing them as a child in a sense, or at least emotionally like a child, you know, and going, OK, I can actually have empathy because I'm, I have evolved past this place. I can almost have empathy and I don't wanna say pity, but in a way you can give them the benefit of the doubt because you're like, okay, they're just not quite there yet. And so I think that helps, at least for me, the energetics of the relationship can change if you're not taking everything so personally. And I, I like that because the response, and we talk about this diffusion technique with ourselves of, you know, when you're beating yourself up, you're getting really upset with yourself and your actions, picture yourself as a five-year-old Mm-hmm. Would you be yelling and screaming at yourself and cussing and saying you're a loser, you can't do this? No, you would be more supportive. Yeah. This same level of communication can happen in this 
regard. Hey, she's acting like a child. I wouldn't yell and berate a child. I wouldn't do that. They don't have the ability to see beyond what's going on here. So that's a very good frame to think about, especially your reaction. I think that's the other thing. You know, some of this is going to be goading you into reacting in a negative way so that she can knock you off that pedestal around your children. And it's important for you to be the bigger person, to set your ego aside and say, hey, you know, let me have it, but let's do it outside of the house. Let's do it in the backyard. Let's do it around the block. And then let's go back to treating our kids respectfully. I think when mentioned about therapy, having it out in the, in the, in the presence of a therapist who is able to allow conversation to move in the right direction uh, is certainly going to be important. And with for that. kids, it's yes, it sucks that you have to agree to go to therapy too. This is her problem. You're seeing it as this is her. I'm but trying what's to be more the important? Exactly. Now we're taking the mature step of saying, hey, our children's lives are more important. Let's try our best with help, outside help, a third party, to see through our differences and heal if we can. Okay, here's the last question for today. This one's from Blair. Hey, Johnny and AJ, love y'all's podcast. I feel my boyfriend is lazy. (laughs) How do I express my frustration towards him without him getting upset? To add a little context, we've been together for almost a year. We both met at a time he was the CEO of a company for two plus years and I had just been promoted at a Fortune 500 company. We moved in together after four months of dating. We talk about marriage and our future together and everything has been great. But the problem is he sold a percentage of his company and now uses the, I worked 80 hours a week for the past two years as a way to compensate for his laziness. I'd like to see him work towards a new startup he's mentioned or contribute advice to other startups. He always gets defensive anytime I try to bring it up. Before we get married one day, I need to be sure he's motivated to be his best self, even if he was once CEO for two years. Johnny, you, you're laughing Juicy. over here, so I feel like you got... Well, I, there's, a, there's a lot going on here. We could have some fun with this. You know, my, my first thought is he just sold this company how, not very long ago. Like... We know, and, and and certainly you know, and building a company, this is your child. This is, and then when you're working with people, you're building a relationship, uh, an, an intimate relationship where everyone, certainly in, in entrepreneurship, you are working with another person into the unknown. So everyone's insecurities and limits are going to be exposed. So there's a lot of intimacy in getting to know somebody. And, and you're, and you're really raw from that that exposure and for her to be like okay so like you need to get onto something else yeah but i but there's a, i think there's a healing process for this poor guy to to just figure perhaps like what is it that he wants to do what is the next move and and learn and once again l- learning w- what that might be i think I, I, I just want to make sure that well, he has I know a little space there. A lot of founders at this point over the 12 years of networking who've cashed out and then have felt lost. Yeah. And have been fearful of starting something new because what if it it's fails? Successful, yeah. Right? I had this, Johnny, you could talk about bands. I had this yeah. great album that came out. I'm terrified about going in studio for album number two. Oh, sure. And it failing. And in that, there's also obviously running a company your ego is tied to that company yep. and now that piece is no longer there so i would definitely say in this situation give a little bit of space <laughs> and again anytime we want to motivate someone we're going to motivate them most by our own actions and i'll tell you what i've had bouts of laziness and hanging out with amy and watching her get up in the morning and crush work and crush workouts and run a blog it fires me up too. And I want to get moving. And it it does allow me to overcome some of those moments where I'm like, well, yeah, it'd be easier to stay in bed today, or it'd be easier to just cancel all my meetings and not show up. So I find that I get a lot of energy and fuel from my partner. And this could be an opportunity for you to showcase to him that exact thing of giving him some energy by getting yourself moving and, and putting your nose to the grindstone. The other thing is 
of course, there's going to be defensiveness anytime you bring it up. I, again, we keep going back to this like, well, I'm waiting for the perfect moment where the sun is right and he's just going to sit there and say, oh, great, I totally shred agree. me. This is exactly <laughs> what I wanted to hear from the person that I care about. There's always going to be a level of defensiveness. We can't get away from that. But that doesn't mean he's not listening and it doesn't mean that he can't change. Also, anyone who's run a company will know that you can't be lazy and run a company. You may no. have read books online about three hour work weeks and six <laughs> hour work weeks, but no one running a company, managing a team of people is lazy. So I highly doubt that this funk he's going through is any way representative of the rest of his life and what you have to look forward to. Yeah, and I love that, and I agree about setting the example. But and also, you know, I'm I'm very much like a, a person who wants everyone to have the full experience that they need to have. So I'm very much like, okay, he's in that space right now. You might not. I think the problem comes in when like you start to not respect the person. Then maybe you don't find him as attractive, and like maybe there's some implications there. But in terms of like just tactically allowing for him the space, and instead of saying, hey, when are you going to get a job, or when are you going to start a business, or what are you going to maybe ask roundabout questions, things like, well, what do you passionate about like you can do anything now like what is it that gets you fired up like what you know and you can kind of start from that ground zero about passion and purpose instead of going right to like when are you gonna get a job when are you gonna get off the couch I think those kinds of questions can feel really attacking versus just being curious and having more conversations and get them to and saying let's try more. this let's try that let's do this together and if it's been too and if it's been like so long I would look for the emotions that he's like his daily emotions is he you know is he angry is he tired like what are his daily emotions and then from there you can you know go Hey, like I'm noticing this about you. Is it because you're not engaged? Well, I you hit it with the with the emotions. Like he sold it. Was he forced to sell? Has this was this his baby? And then, for whatever reason, was forced out. Like, can, the, the how draining would that be? And 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 to pick yourself up. It's like, okay, I'm waiting around. It's four months. You've done nothing. Well, four months. That is no time to hold from really anything. I, I think they I, need I've been I've 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 had bands fall apart and four months was not enough. I, I can attest to that. <laughs> I've been drying Johnny's eyes for months. You know, I think also what's what can be hard about situations like this is I mean, I could just speak from my own personal experience, is that if, if I start to lose respect for my partner in some way, as much as I'd be like, Well, I should respect the fact that he built this company, whatever, still there's that in the in real time you know, I kind of, I'm not finding you as attractive and they need to maybe have a conversation around that. So if she notices that like, maybe she's just not as attracted to him anymore, like that's real and it's valid. And it doesn't mean he needs to do anything, but it does mean they need to have a conversation about that. We're going down this path of like, I'm kind of losing respect for you a little bit. And that's not your fault. I realize you just came off what you came off, but like that is happening for me. And I don't know how we, can we just talk about that? Yeah, before it turns into resentment and then yeah. turns into something that can't be fixed. Right. Right. We're at a place now where you're feeling it. Trust your gut and be honest about it. And we always say lead from the seat that you're in and your actions will inspire far more than your criticisms will. Yeah. It's a good one. It's juicy. Thank you so much for joining <laughs> us. We really appreciate fun. you being vulnerable and sharing your story. I yes. know that a lot of our audience members have gone through very difficult situations in navigating relationships and it's not black and white it's not as cut and dry as we like to think and it's always easier before you've experienced it to have these viewpoints mm -hmm. and it's more nuanced and we really appreciate mm -hmm. your candor oh thank you guys so much for having me this is fun great thank yeah. you where can our listeners check you out and your podcast uh yeah so the podcast is called the best life podcast and actually if you listen to the first episode it's a short one we actually tell the story of like the infidelity and kind of why we came together um and we talk a lot about relationships personal development Development. in my business at jillfit.com it's mostly around business and fitness and nutrition so if you want like the more juicy very raw very real relationship conversations that's happening on the best life but yeah hit me up on insta uh, it's at jillfit if you want to send me a dm and connect that way that's probably the easiest right on. awesome yeah. thank you thank you guys